Welcome, welcome, people joining. Francia looking sharp as ever. <laughs> Good to see you. I'm happy the algorithm always puts your video there up front so I can see. There are already almost 130 people. So hello, Are, Alexi, hello, Yipe. There is an AI that only puts people I know into this form. So I don't know. Nice to see you. I also realized from last time that when we're recording these videos, now uh, some of your faces actually end up being in the video, but now I actually moved your faces at least on my screen so you don't have to worry about it. And if we're ever gonna publish these videos, I think we might have to do something that people who are not given their permission to put their faces, we're gonna do something about it. So. Okay, nice to have you back. We are 150 more or less. Um, Welcome back to Facilitating Change. Woo, yeah. I still don't have those sound effects here. But I did find that in Zoom, you can actually produce computer sound into this stream. So I'll maybe figure out by the end of the course. What has happened? Uh, <clears throat> the first lecture we had was about paradigms, uncertain landscape, setting the scene for the whole course. A week ago, I was here alone, just like I'm now in this bunker. Not sure if I'm the only person in this huge building, but nevertheless, I'm here again. Last week, talk about organizational transformation. And I did add a slide about last week. So uh, to give you more good stuff, uh, just to remind you that, of course, whatever I talked last week was kind of just selected one perspective, my what I wanted to give you and what I have found reasonable. My point being change management models when we get to organization transformation has been, of course, studied quite a lot. So actually I'm uh, supervising a thesis by Niklas and these are from Niklas's thesis where he does a great job of bringing together all different change management models, mainly these three. And I really like the fact that if you took the Lewin model, it's already from 1951. And if you remember what we talked last time uh, about different maturities and different processes where we go, here you can see very, very similar stuff going on. Uh, I like the one from 1951. It must be good because it still survives. It's just unfreeze the current ways of thinking, change, and then freeze again. Kind of good simplicity there. Um, nevertheless, have a look at these if you're more interested in, in uh, the literature on different models on change management, uh, especially in organizational context. And uh, I think Niklas's thesis is going to come up sooner or later. So have a look at that as well. Good. So that was a quick about last week. And today, uh, going to talk about lean agile design, lean startup and what, what, what mainly trying to give my take on answering the question, which one to choose? And uh, if you're smart people and you most are very smart people, you know the answer is, it depends. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And then uh, I'm gonna introduce you with the, uh, the Wenger's model of thinking about participation and all that. And trying to wrap it all into something that makes sense. But let's not go there yet uh, because Let's look what uh, what you did last week. So having looked at the uh, exercises, no, I haven't looked at each and every one. Uh, I did a bit of a sampling and looked at what kind of things you actually wrote down and what kind of things popped up and what you talked about in the, in your reflections and all that. So I'm kind of tempted to say I was looking at your exercises and this word dumb popped into my mind, but you might get the wrong connotations here. Uh, the thing about those exercises, let's see, uh, before we actually go into what those exercises taught me and what we're going to do this week, this is something when we're talking about when we, the exercise you had the project and then you looked into the impacts and kind of the goals and the objectives and all that, uh, I started thinking about dumb things. And this is something that you know, most of you or maybe of you have learned, heard about this. This is an excellent forward criteria for if you have an objective or you're measuring something, uh, you have a goal, then you can always make this acid test whether 
is your objective, is it doable? Is it understandable? Is it measurable? And is it beneficial? In other words, taking you wherever you want to go when you're actually writing down those objectives. So let's see what I mean. Oh, yeah, I had this uh, reminder. Sometimes it's actually hard to achieve if you think about objectives of a project or objectives of your organization. And you want those objectives and metrics and goals to be dumb. It's not necessarily that easy. Because often, sometimes objectives are so vague that, uh, or sometimes they're not easily measurable. But you'll see what I mean. So here are a couple of, uh, from the exercises I picked up. Some, I'm not saying that the ones on the left are dumb. I'm not saying the ones on the right are worse. But you can see what I mean. So last week in the exercise, you were writing different kind of goals and objectives and impacts. And of course, the challenge is that you typically start writing, it's very ambiguous. It's not that clear. And what I mean by clear, if you look at the right-hand side, is that how do you know if you have actually achieved that impact? And if it's very ambiguous, then you really don't. So for example, here I picked a few ones. The user experience has changed. Well, if that's the impact you're aiming for, how do you know that has happened? Is it doable, understandable, measurable, beneficial? Or our staff has updated their ways of working. You know, that's a goal, that's an objective. And that's perfectly fine as a beginning, but could you actually have another spin on it? Or we have new customers. On the left-hand side, I picked a couple of examples of impacts that I think are dumb, in a way, doable, understandable, measurable. So somebody had a 30-page handbook ready. Well, that's actually very easy to know whether you have achieved it or you haven't. The handbook is either ready or it is not ready. Is it measurable? Well, is there a handbook? Well, it is measurable. Or funding accepted, that you have applied for funding and then you got it. You either get it or you don't. There is no gray area. And uh, is it measurable? Sounds like it could be. Or a thesis submitted. But I'm not sure you get the point. So if you look at these objectives, some of them are very, very clear or impacts, which brings me to the point uh, of how do you actually facilitate? So if you look at the ones I have on the right-hand side, uh, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying that hmm, as a facilitator, how could I help that person to have another spin on it? How could I help them make them less ambiguous. How can I help them clarify those impacts? So playing dumb is of course the question and uh, kind of obvious here but I mean just basic questions you can start asking. Imagine yourself in last week's exercise asking the other person that okay your, what, what do you think will be the impact of your project three months after it is done? And then they say well uh, our customers are buying more. Well, then you start asking, then you start playing dumb, literally, asking questions about those goals, impacts, and objectives. The number one question I think is very efficient is just how will you know, rather than asking what are the metrics, just ask them how will you know you have been successful? To put it in other words, what needs to have happened in six months from now for you to be happy? And you can be the individual. So what do you think are the criteria? So in other words, that second question is asking, what are the success criteria from your personal perspective? Or the you can be the team. You as a team, what needs to have happened in six months from now for you to be happy? What do you as a team think are the success criteria? And then you start asking more of these questions. How will you know whether that has actually happened? How will you know, you know, customers change behavior? How will you know whether that has happened? And then we go actually into questions about how do you measure it? What are the metrics? Is it measurable in the first place? And the tougher question is, of course, how will you know if that has not happened? Because if we're looking for, let's say, positive change, how do you, you know, where it's 
you're doing your best trying to find anything that indicates that that happened. But how do you know if that does not happen? Uh, then the next question is really about, okay, let's say that our objective is that we, our sales increase. Well, is selling one more thing, is that enough? Well, if not selling one more thing is enough, how many is enough? Can you give me a number? Is it measurable? Or maybe it's a percentage and so forth and so forth. And how would you, that be beneficial? So somebody gives you another objective or goal or metric. Typically, if you think about KPIs, uh, when people are a little bit, how should I say, skeptical about them, I think it's typically the issue is that they don't see why these metrics are beneficial for either themselves individually or the organization at large. And then the last question is, of course, how can you measure that? So customers are happier. How can you measure that? What are the measurements of it? And it doesn't mean that you have to push everything into quantifiable measurements all the time. But the question is that you start the discussion from the other person that actually, are we measuring the right thing? Maybe the answer is that, well, happiness is such a qualitative thing that we cannot put a number on it, but we need to measure it somehow. And then you start thinking about how do you measure it? So to really hammer this part in is playing dumb with champagne. So for example, uh, Yes, this is a trick I've always been using for past many, many years when, when coaching or facilitating or, or whatever leading uh, teams and we're putting down objectives and, and success criteria. The point of this champagne example is you take the discussion kind of out of the metrics, quantifiable KPI context, which sometimes is not necessarily very creative or something. Anyway. The point is that you say that, hey, let's, let's have this role play. Let's imagine, or literally you can buy that bottle of champagne. I bought this bottle of champagne for our team. It's very expensive. Everybody goes, whoa. So let's drink this if we have been successful one month from now. Yeah, 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 let's do it. And then we start the discussion. So what's the criteria? Let's put this into the fridge. So what do we write here as the rules that from one month from now, we can open the fridge and open the champagne and drink it. And then you get the people into the right mindset. So it has to be measurable. It has to be unambiguous because a month from now, you're standing in front of the fridge. You want to be sure that whether can I drink it or can I not drink it? So you go, is it doable? Is it understandable? Is it measurable? And then of course you might want to think, how does it benefit us in this project? Drinking that champagne has its benefits, but is it actually benefits the criteria we just put for drinking it? Is it taking us further in the context of whatever the team is doing? So that's playing down with champagne. And that's kind of adding the third one into these exercises we have been doing. Now, if you look at these side by side, this week's exercises, and yes, you kind of guess next week's exercise is going to be the, the champagne exercise. Uh, these are exercises really to clarify things, clarify the objectives, clarify what are you talking about, clarify where are we aiming at, clarifying what do you mean when you say middle management, and so forth, and so forth. So remember the onion, that was really about organizational context. So what's the context where we are doing this transformation or change? Last week's exercise was really actually figuring out what's the desired impact we're aiming at. And intentionally pushing that the impact is further down the road than just when the project ends officially. And now the third spin is the champagne part where you actually look at those desired impacts and goals and success criteria. And you have another spin. Are they doable, understandable, measurable, and beneficial? Why? Because people tend to write down very vague and ambiguous objectives and impacts. You, as a facilitator, when you really try to understand how do you facilitate this process, you need clear goals. So to put this into a uh, Again, a simple picture or example. So last week we talked about organization, culture transformation. 
So let's say that the project starts and uh, you are hired as a consultant to facilitate it. And then the big bosses give you the ambiguous objectives. This is what we want from the new culture. This is what we want from the transformation. So these are the tools you think about. Okay, you need to clarify the context. So you use something like the onion exercise. And then you get a new version of the objectives which actually have a better contextual understanding. And then you start the next, second discussion is what is actually the desired impact of these objectives? Are they impactful? So you do that exercise and then you get a new version of those objectives and now they have an impact as well. And then the third part is really doing this third iteration where you actually look at the desired impacts with the actual understanding of the context and you really kind of, how should I say, really clarify and sharpen the criteria that how do we know that this transformation project is on the right track, that where everybody understands what are the impacts we're aiming at and everything makes sense because we understand the context and so forth and then you continue. So that's kind of bringing together these exercises. Uh, again, really hammering in that these are tools for whatever the project is to help you figure out. And now that you have been doing, I'm also, you can see I'm also counting on the fact that you're next week gonna do the champagne exercise. So the exercises have been more or less just asking questions, listening what the other person says, and then drawing some kind of a summary. So now you can see what the facilitation work pretty much is, is asking, listening, drawing. You can be writing as well, of course, but it's asking, listening, synthesizing maybe would be a good one. And like I said, it doesn't have to be an organization transformation project. You can take any project which has been the exercise it's doing these weeks and you can apply these and figure out did you facilitate them to understand the context better? Did you facilitate them to understand the impacts better? And now this coming week, uh, how are you facilitating them to answer them the criteria, the success criteria better? By asking questions, listening and summarizing. Okay, that was really kind of reminding the bigger picture that these individual lectures are doing their best trying to draw a bigger picture and make sense. Uh, and actually we talked with Yari earlier about his lecture next week and he's pretty much going to continue from this and going into the actual more face-to-face human-to-human facilitation part of it. So now being kind of on an, I've been on an organization level. But the exercises, as you have noticed, have been very, very much on human-to-human uh, -human level. Good. So kind of the first part of today, we're going to have a break today as well, uh, five minutes. And then we're going to, after the break, have a quick break, break room as well, where I'm going to ask you to chat in the groups again. So be aware. Uh, but the big question is that, where do I start? So the context is that you are, again, imagine you are facilitating some kind of a change in an organization and uh, probably these hyped fashionable terms are floating in the air. You're probably familiar with each of school of thought or religion, if you will. Uh, so which one is the best? Which one do I choose? Well, let's go back to the first lecture. So this is the context, broadly speaking. And uh, due to this uh, virus running around on the planet, the uncertainty aspect has been amplified quite a lot. Uh, but even before the virus, we had things like digitalization and, and global markets and all that causing a lot of uncertainty. But the point from the first lecture was that uncertainty, yes, the problem is you can't plan it. You cannot necessarily plan five years ahead or 10 years ahead. So the typical knee reflex has been, we shall build a responsive culture. That's the answer. So culture, what do you mean by culture? Well, actually I'm doing talking about the culture of doing, how people do ways of working, how they actually do the new changes and, and product development and all that. Uh, then doing actually pretty much once you go down that road becomes a question about routines and tools. 
So what are the routines that we want people to do? What are the actual tools we want them to use? And typically that's where the Lean Startup Agile Design Lean Thinking comes in is that these popular tools are practical. They seem to fit many things, but they also bring with them a certain mindset and a certain way of working. And that's kind of my take why they are popular because they seem to be the cure for the headache that this uncertainty is causing. So just to kind of recap different schools of thought, I'm not going to dig deeper into these, but just to kind of, or should I say, put these on a table for us here this afternoon. We have, of course, agile school of thought that comes very much from software development. Uh, we talked a little bit about in the first lecture, this kind of being an anti-Taylorism thing. Uh, and there you can see the principles are nicely there. Individuals, interactions, working software, customer collaboration, and so forth. And uh, we have things such as Scrum coming from this, and, and it has a long history. So it's one of school of thought. Then we have actually an older school of thought than Agile is, of course, all the lean schools of thought. And we have things such as this lean transformation model uh, where the, you know, the first thing you can see there is a situational approach, which is pretty much what Yari and me and this course are really teaching, that there are no ready answers, that you need to understand the context and you need to act based on the situation and so forth. And you get capability development and so on. And in this picture, I think it's a good example. It's really about a management system. So if agile world comes from project working in a software context, this is a management system. Or you can get these different kinds of lean houses, if you will. And these are fantastic and these are great. And, and, and they're just a different approach. They come from a different history. Uh, creating a learning organization. Well, that's a, kind of another way of saying creating a responsive organization and so forth. I think I have uh, at least one more. Yeah, this is a screenshot. This is kind of the Six Sigma Lean, which is another sub-school of Lean, which is really a focus is on, on production, kind of, and, and comes from, really has a resonance from the physical world where the Lean comes from, from the car manufacturing. And you have concepts such as waste, and you have overproduction, and, and you have debt, and all that stuff. And then, of course, we have the Lean Startup, which happens to have the word lean in it. And uh, I'm actually, uh, people actually mix them up, uh, maybe because they haven't necessarily uh, either read the other school of thought. But this is, of course, based on, has a lot of similar philosophies as lean, but really comes from Steve Blank's and, and of course, Eric Ries' book is the, the seminal thing that really captured it, where the philosophy is that iteration cycle that, you actually build something, then you measure very quickly whether it's actually achieving what you wanted, and then you systematically work on learning based on those measurements. And then once you have learned as a team, then you build more. And then this cycle goes measured maybe in days rather than months. So the really the fast thing and the rapid cycling of this. And then of course we have the design school of thought. Uh, which I try to capture in this one Venn diagram over here, uh, which is really focusing on desirability and taking the end user slash customer in the beginning and understanding what do they want and, and uh, thinking from there. Uh, but has a lot of things about how you should work on it, what you should think about it. And all the tools, again, imply a certain way of thinking and imply even certain way of behaving as a team or as a professional. Uh, this I put in the slides for today. Uh, I recommend looking at this talk. This is from Ule. Ule Arena has this talk, where is this Jet, uh, Jeff Gotthelf's talk from a year ago, where he did his best. So as, as the title says, these are his principles that work with any methodology. So really trying to, again, take all of these things together and his 10 things that I think that hold true whether you're doing a design or lean thinking or lean startup and so forth. And these are great. I recommend uh, looking at that video. Uh, but the question I'm asking now, 
that if we take all of these and put them into our uh, hands, and think that if these are the medicine, what is the illness they are trying to cure? Because these are, all are kind of presented as solutions. That take this, uh, take that. So what is actually behind? What is the illness that this medicine is trying to cure? Now, this is kind of my take on it. I'm not saying that there's any research on it, but it's really, this is my take on it. And I'm really uh, kind of pushing you to look at these and think in this way. But if I look at these uh, and be kind of familiar with some of them even more, some of them less work with projects, I would say that behind the principles, the question, <coughs> sorry, the questions that these are answering are, A, what is valuable work? And what is valued in general? I think those are the really you try to distill the main point of design thinking, every school of lean and, and lean startup. It boils down that people are working in a work context, what is valuable? And these tools and thinkings and philosophies help you to understand yourself what is valuable and what is valued in general. And also, as you can see in the bullet points, there's lots and lots about those things. Lots and lots about how to work in a team. So how does teamwork work? How to work with uncertainty? That's really kind of the ghost there in the background. How do you actually communicate within the team, outside the team, with customers, with executives and all that? And then last but not least, all of these schools kind of push you so you don't get fixed on one solution. As you kind of look at all different corners and if you get the solution, you're very skeptical about it and then it shows you methods and thinking of how do you do not get fixated on it. And kind of if you've been working on this area, you, are, you know the word, the V word over there, valuable and value, because especially if I would say that in a software engineering context, kind of where my history comes from. Everybody was talking about how to generate value. Let's, let's get rid of waste so that we produce value. And you have people saying things such as, you know, we're not doing this for money. We're doing this to generate value. So the whole V word becomes this almost magical thing that everybody's aiming at. And I think it's a good thing because the ver word value is, it, then it depends what is valuable work and what is valued in general. It really depends on what does the word value mean. So my next question is, so does this mean that you as a leader or a facilitator, the solution is that I just define what is value and we're done. If value, what is valuable, what is valuable work, is the thing that really ties together all these schools of thought, then it boils down to the fact that, well, if I just tell people that this is value, then things just, you know, start magically working and we are done. Kind of. Uh, now, the thing I, I'm going <laughs> to talk about before the, the next 25 minutes is the fact that well, there are no ready answers, of course. This is kind of where we began, where we started doing this uh, lecture series. We have different lenses and we have different perspectives. But on the other hand, we cannot work in a world where we don't have meanings. What I mean that is that you, you, if you're a facilitator, you're a change leader, and if every time you go to tell people, well, there are no answers, well, the world is very complex. Where well, there's just this multiplicity going on. You are not going to go anywhere. As peoples, we need to have some kind of concrete things. And that's why I said that, yes, if everybody in the organization understands what is value, if everybody in the organization understands what is valuable, then kind of, yes, everything just kind of, just suddenly starts working much better. But the problem is there are already answers. You simply just cannot go and tell people 
that this is what value is. Well, you can, but I'm saying that that's not very efficient. Perhaps that's the old way of thinking. That's when the big boss, let's say, that's when the, uh, the George Eastman, the founder of Kodak in 1903 came and said that this is value for our company. He was a smart guy. That was probably a good answer. So it is kind of depressing, just like this poor little dog over here is. Uh, what we said in the past two lectures is that there's no single organization culture. It's too complex. There's different lenses, there's different perspectives, you need to understand the context and everything. And now I'm telling you also that there's no clear definition of value. So what I'm saying is that everything kind of in this change and transformation boils down into what is value and valuable, but no, there's not a clear definition for that either. Everything is relative. So yeah, it is kind of depressing. And it really actually makes the old way of thinking very tempting. It had clear answers. This is the culture. This is value. Start working. If you don't like it, I can hire other people. So shared meanings, let's dive a little bit deeper for a minute. Uh, and actually more than a minute, 25 minutes says my clock. And now I kind of showed this a little bit, uh, I think last time. And I'm gonna really, how should I say, drink heavily from this bucket of knowledge called uh, Communities of Practice by Etienne Wenger, which is a relatively famous book depends of course then uh, what kind of bars and, and circles you hang out in but uh, sometimes it surprised me when i talk about this book people are like wow fantastic i read that book when i was studying to become a teacher or something like that but this is a fantastic book and uh, i really has changed my way of thinking and i'm trying to now to explain to you what i really got out of this as a facilitator and in this context of, of organization transformation so remember, the thing we're going to talk about in the next 20 minutes is shared meanings, which simply means that if everybody in these organizations has more or less the same meaning for this concept, then the pieces of the puzzle fit together. But what Mr. Wenger says, so first of all says that we don't actually make meanings independent of the world, neither does the world impose meaning on us. So when we define meanings, let's say the meaning for the word value or the meaning for agile culture, agile culture in our organization, we don't do that independent of the outside world, but neither does the outside world impose meanings. So there are no clear answers. And then what he goes on explaining is that the meaning is located in the process of negotiation. And that is really the diagram uh, I'm going to have almost on every slide. The process of negotiation, which has two parts, participation and reification. So let's look at that a little bit more. Well, this has the same thing all over again. So this is engineer me trying to put this very clunky way, uh, maybe cutting some corners here. So. But to me, the way I understand it is this. So let's say we're trying to figure out in our company, in our organization, what is agile culture for us? So first of all, what Wenger says us that, you know, when we get together with our colleagues and we have the teams meeting where we discuss what is agile culture for us, we need to remember that we actually came from somewhere. We have a history, we have background. Everybody in that meeting has their history, their background. So for example, this person here has probably thought about it. Oh, that's agile culture for us. Now I have some kind of a starting point. This is, the, this is my meaning for agile culture. And then they go into the meeting with their meaning of it. And of course, the other people don't necessarily share that meaning. Okay, bye -bye. And after the meeting, the other people go and talk with other people as well. So it came from somewhere and it will eventually go somewhere. Again, very, very simply. So if the question is that you are with your colleagues trying to figure out what does agile culture mean for us? So let's say on the 29th of April, you came up with this. This is agile culture for us. 
and then a week from now because that person talked with that your thinking changed a little bit you get together and you talk again and at what is then it's a little bit different now it, the agile culture looks a bit like that and so forth and so forth so just like we've been saying it becomes that there's no it kind of becomes obvious once you put it like this that it is kind of almost a living thing it is a process which means if you remember Yari's slide from the first lecture it really the contextuality of it what agile culture means on the 4th of may for us in this room boils down into the language and the meanings we have the relationality processuality and practices so of course it's very contextual and that's what wenger is saying that the shared meaning is of course very contextual and what he reminds us oh that's the next slide uh, so again i put the here just to remind me to say it aloud this sounds very obvious this is not complex uh you know you could almost take a kid and they understand that these meanings change because we have different people and these people change during those dates i put there but somehow it is so very easily forgotten somehow i've seen many many times whether it's a project or organization transformation people tend to forget they start to build literally carve in stone what does agile culture mean for us or carve in stone what is value and that's really that's really against the kind of that we kind of understand that is obvious so here's i put this other picture to maybe again demonstrate on, on help you understand what this means tempted to say a kind of everybody has been in this kind of a meeting that let's say that these gentlemen over here are discussing the fact what does agile culture mean for us then there's one person saying that no 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 it cannot mean that because agile means scrum i can give you five books where it says agile says scrum and uh, then the other person on the left is that well whatever you said what you just wrote over there is just what lean startup is all about and then maybe somebody is pointing their finger but you know our company isn't pa 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 and then one person is maybe beginning to be frustrated about it. So my point being that maybe this kind of a situation, if you're familiar with it, just demonstrates that how easily we forget that we cannot, we need to accept that there are very different meanings, that it's all very contextual and all we come from. And we somehow tend to look for a universal, unambiguous definition for things such as agile culture. So what Wenger actually says that reminds, generally speaking, is that the whole negotiated meaning just reminds, it is historical. We bring whatever happened before into the table. And the organization's history is, of course, uh, very strong in this. It's dynamic. It changes all the time as we negotiate. It's contextual that we talk about. And just what maybe these guys in this previous picture forgot it is unique the next time things are different so it's really yes you need to kind of try to boil it down but you have to accept it that next time we meet it has changed when then of course it comes back to this process and that's what really what wenger is talking about that we have these two parts which is the participation is where the guys get together in the picture and then it's the reification where they actually write down. So let's all, so we have all agreed that it means this. But the point is that it starts all over again. So let's go over one, one at a time. So the participation part for us in this course, I'm sure you're familiar with a situation like this, is that everybody, we let people participate. What does agile culture mean for us? And everybody gets their opinions and it's a, it's a workshop uh, and in a workshop you understand we have things such as our feelings at that moment we have what people say what they're talking what people are thinking what are their social roles in that actual workshop in that meeting 
Do they have a membership in a community? So if I'm invited into that team, Risto, come over because you're a designer. And then I'm like, shit, I'm representing every designer in this community of designers. And suddenly my kind of social role and my membership in this community becomes different. And all of these things affect when this uh, person over there is trying to facilitate a shared meaning of what is agile culture for us. So participation is kind of this what to me it's all in simplicity it is kind of this where people negotiate and literally talk together what is this meaning about then there's the other part the reification part and uh, that word is not probably something you use on everyday language participation you might use you understand what participation means well uh i like the fact that the word res in the reification means is latin and means a thing and an object then I actually went to the internet and checked out what reification means. And there's this perfect definition from vocabulary.com. So reification is a complex idea for when you treat something immaterial, such as happiness, fear, evil, agile culture, as a material thing. And as a process, as a process of reification, this can be a way of making something concrete and easier to understand, like how a wedding ring it's the reification of couple's love. That was brilliant. That's exactly what's going on. There's this thing, you know, couple's love, agile culture, very similar. And how do you actually make them concrete? How do you make them understandable or easier to understand, just like vocabulary.com says? And that's the thing about reification. How do you make it easier to understand? How do you make it concrete? And of course, this is what we do. This is reification. We make documents, we make plans, we maybe draw maps, we do videos. We might build a monument for agile culture. Uh, or like the photograph here is implying what we do a lot of, again, things on a wall. We draw things, we sketch things and so forth. But on a broader scale, it's all that, that I have listed there. I think a perfect example is contracts, legal contracts. That is a reification of something that we just discussed, we have a shared meaning. We have a shared understanding of something immaterial and let's put it onto a contract. Now that's a reification process. And what Wenger teaches us that they come as a pair. You can't have one without the other or you can, but then things fall apart. Let's go over that. So on the other hand, you need to have these discussions. You need to open it up for people to give their opinions, to understand what they're saying, what are their perspectives, what are the lenses, if you will. But you also need then to map them down. You need to reify them. So if you think them as kind of, you know, one helps the other, reification makes up really for the limitations of participation. So just imagine uh, a workshop, and I think I have an example here. Uh, anyway, imagine a workshop, but nobody does any documentation. How do you remember what we decided? How do you remember that anything what happened? So really taking notes is the simplest of verifications. And uh, then on the other hand side, participation makes up for the limitations of the verification. So here the examples are for Wenger's book. So if you think that we have treaties between nations, but we still have ambassadors who kind of participate and negotiate and all that. So the treaty is the concrete thing, but ambassadors are the facilitators that things happen. The same with judges and law. The law says that this happens, but judges are there to interpret in the actual context, in this project, how do we interpret the law? Products. Products are concrete things that can be extremely concrete, just like a cup, but customer support. That's where I call and we start negotiating the meaning. What does this cup actually mean to me? Or workshop and the results, just like I said. And really hammering in from Wenger's uh, points is that if we have too much participation, that if participation dominates, that we don't document anything, that we just workshop the hell out of it. We don't actually have enough material to anchor the specificity, this is his word, specificity of coordination to uncover assumptions, which means just in all simplicity, just imagine that you always just workshops, but nobody actually documents and anchors down so we can actually coordinate outside the workshop where we are going. 
Yeah, that was my example. But if on the other hand, if you have just have reification, where you don't have any discussions, that you just get these documents saying that this is value, this is our culture. You literally, you get the memo. The big boss from upstairs tells you that this is the thing. I have just reified our company culture into these five bullets and there's no discussion. Then the problem is, like Wenger says, there's not overlap in participation to recover coordinated relevant generated meaning. So people are just given these concepts and nobody makes sure that everybody understands them in the first place. Nobody makes sure that everybody understands them in the same way. So again, what he says, we take principles, tools, uh, and ideas from the world, such as we take design thinking or business model canvas or lean startup we take from the world, but they can't be our meaning as such. So we cannot take them as such into our organization and start working. We need to negotiate the meaning for ourselves and ourselves here is the organization. And that really brings my point here. Now we're kind of shifting what Wenger says more into my interpretation of it. And that's where I see leadership comes in. I see what leader or a facilitator, change agent, whatever you call yourself, we need to curate those reifications. Somebody needs to be looking after the reification part of it. And also we need somebody to look after and help with the participation of it. So if I put images for it, so we need change agent. We need people who are like librarians. So if the library is full of all those reifications, documents, post-its, uh, whiteboards, videos, products, all of the stuff that you produce that capture the immaterial meanings, shared meanings, somebody needs to look after them. But also on the other hand, kind of what typically facilitation means that we need somebody also to facilitate the discussion part, the participation part. And a simple example being that, you know, somebody maybe facilitated this group and now they're gonna go to the next group. It would be nice that, you know, they can build on coordinate and build on top of each other so that you don't start from zero every time when the participation starts. And you can call the person I think we need, especially in organizations, in this context is change agent. Typically designers find themselves in this role, especially if you have a service designer hat on, that you are actually helping the organization and all the reifications, and then you have all these workshops and participations. You're kind of find yourself balancing between these two. Or to put it simply, we just need someone to do this. Especially if you think about, uh, I like the word leader here, especially if you really dismiss the old traditional leadership where the leader just tells you, where it's pretty much just reification part. And typically we understand that, yeah, we need this participation. People just can't anymore tell top down what happens because these people are independent, autonomous, smart there at the customer so you need to have the participation part but i think what the wenger model really taught me was that you actually need to have the reification part as well as a leader you need to be looking over that how do you actually materialize this here's an example uh halton is a finnish company relatively big that actually does uh all kind of technology for air, uh, I think is the word air conditioning. But for example, the circulating the air in, in a special uh, like kitchens or special uh, facilities where you actually need to have special equipment for, for uh, keeping the air circulating and all that. So the story goes, this is actually the uh, Halton Group leader told me about this in a workshop. So he told that the, that's their mission. There it's in Finnish and then it's underneath is my translation into English. We enable people's well-being in demanding indoor environments. That's their mission. Okay, most of you 
maybe you have never heard of Halt and are like, mm, okay, sounds like a typical corporate mission. What's so special about it? Well, when you listen to uh, Kai Konola's story about it, he said that once we went pretty much through the whole company, listened to everybody, talked with everybody, do, did all the participation, ratification, and came up with that mission statement, then magic started to happen. So for example, suddenly that mission statement was a part, important part for decision-making, kind of became a framework for them company-wide. Uh, the commitment from shareholders, they could start discussing it around that mission statement. It was a growth, uh, starting point for the growth strategy, help them differentiate, selecting partners. But most importantly, what he said was important was the commitment and meaningfulness of the employees. People started really understanding that the bigger picture, what, what does it mean to work for this company and so forth. But the point of the story is this last here, is not that all of this magic didn't happen because that mission sentence was somehow magical. That's kind of a typical corporate mission statement. But the magic really happened kind of behind uh, the doors. And that's, they did a lot of work to create a company-wide share meaning for that one sentence. So the whole company understood the work, the discussions, the things behind that sentence. And that's when all the magic happened. And I think this is a great story. And you could take the participation reification and I can almost see them doing that kind of work to get there. Good. So we're gonna have a break soon. Uh, after the break, I'm going just to let you know, I'm gonna ask you to break into rooms and then talk about what kind of meanings, I'm gonna glimpse you, so this is the session. So what kind of meanings you probably have to curate. So what kind of terms, concepts, things you think that everybody should understand the same way in your organization or generally speaking. But uh, let's have a break now, five minutes.